working as, as a professional web developer in the area. From a very young age, Thomas has always had a deep appreciation of technology and its ability to shape our culture and lives. Currently, he has built over 30 websites, has 1,000 plus hours of 3D printing experience, and is working to develop his first virtual reality application. Join him on this discussion of some of the latest technology advancements of our generation, and find out more about Thomas and his work at his website and blog at sanction1.com. I know how passionate uh, Thomas is about virtual reality, so please join me in welcoming Mr. Thomas Jackson. Virtual reality, the future is here. All right, I'm excited about the free lap. Um, I'm gonna move around a little bit. I like that. Uh, I'm so excited about VR. And I'm, this is a big room, but it's not full, so it makes me feel comfortable. Um, I'm really excited though. I, I want to do one talk about VR. I, mainly just because it's kind of confusing. <laughs> a lot of people don't really understand how it works and the implications of it, what it's gonna do, et cetera, et cetera. So if I can be that guy, or if I have to be that guy, I don't care. I will do it. My civil service to you. <laughs> I'm going to go out there and I'm going to tell people exactly what VR can do, the potential of it, what it can do, etc. So I hope you guys are excited. I'm excited. And uh, I really appreciate you guys coming out. So, introduction. Um, I thought it would be fun because a lot of people don't really even have a clue. And they have the idea of what VR is. Or they've heard of the term VR before, but they've never actually looked up a definition. If you look it up, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, pretty long. Because uh, a lot of people have had input on that theory for the last, I don't know, 20 years. And there really hasn't been a device that everybody can just look at and go, that's it. It's just been a bunch of conjecture, a bunch of ideas. Um, so I like to start with my definition of VR, like a person definition, my definition of VR. Um, I look at it as, if this is our reality here, and this is where we spend most of our time, here, now, you're in this room, you're listening to me. Um, uh, alternate reality might be, for example, if I walked out and handed somebody in the room some mushrooms. Now, I'm not saying drugs are good. Don't do drugs. I'm just saying if you did, mushrooms are a known psychedelic, and that person would start tripping, okay? They would maybe start seeing pink elephants a lot. Everyone else in the room would be in this reality, our reality. They would be in a different reality. Now, that's drug-induced, and that's a reality we've known about for a long time, but that's not what VR does, but that's the same principles of what VR does. It's playing on the tricks that your brain tells you that this is the reality that you're in. That's what VR does. In order to achieve good, good VR, you have to be able to trick the brain the same way that drug tricks the brain. You have to be able to hit that bar, that, that level, at which your brain forgets where you are and starts just thinking, this is where I am. I'm in this new space. So I thought it'd be fun to do a quick brain tease to kind of um, reiterate that, I guess. I, I look up these all the time. I have these fun little brain teases that I uh, show people all the time. But, so feel free to play along. You don't have to if you want. But one thing I know is if you put your tongue out like this, and then if you turn it upside down, like that, which some people can do, right? And if you try to hold it there, like that, right? You might, you might want to try it. <laughs> All you do is hold it like that and then try to touch your tongue. Now, your brain will tell you that you're not touching the bottom of your tongue, which you should be. It'll tell you that you're, listening, you're touching the top of your tongue. And you know why that is? Because our brains never had to figure that out before. We've never asked that of our bodies before. That's just one of those weird things that you can do right now, and your body will be sending a completely different signal to you. It'll be telling you, hey, you're touching, you're touching the top, but really, your tongue's turned around and you're touching the bottom. So it's those same tricks like that, that VR must play on in order to achieve good VR. That's just, that's just uh, how it is. So, let's talk about the past, right? Because VR has definitely got a history, and uh, it's kind of a long one. And uh, we're going to go through that, we're going to go through the technology briefly, some of the old technology that I'm sure you guys are familiar with and have seen, and then we're going to talk about what failed and why it failed, you know, because it's been failing for years and all of a sudden everybody's excited about VR now, so what's changed, right? Um, media, this is exactly what I'm talking about. This is most people's idea of VR, right? 
got Johnny Mike, my five, this crazy contraction that he puts on, and it just feels dystopic. It feels like, it doesn't feel like it's our world. It feels like it's the world in the future, right? Strange Days, kind of the same thing. Lawn Mower Man, that, I mean, great movie, but really dystopic future of the way the art world, I mean, there's nothing positive, right? And then Tron, maybe it's kind of cool, 82, all the way back then, is being in this complete virtual world, right? But that's most people's thought, or my, my guess, of what they think of when they hear the word VR. And then you have some great books that have been out, which are maybe I highly recommend anybody interested in VR. Ready Player One, which is kind of more of a utopian feel, like what could VR be like in the future. And then you got Snow Crash or Solar, which is more of a little bit dystopic version, but it's still an awesome book, very, very interesting. But we've had these insights before. It's not like we haven't been thinking about VR before. That's my point. We have been as a culture, and we just haven't really had the tech to bring it to life. So, what's that? This is some of the hardware I was telling you about. We've had hardware. Um, it's just haven't been great. <laughs> so, the Virtual Boy was my favorite, and I, I, you know, not kidding, waited in line at Blockbuster, not knowing how bad this was, okay, the Virtual Boy. And, you know, it, honestly, it was bad, but as a kid, I just still had this idea, like, maybe it'll get better, you know, maybe it'll get better. And sure enough, it died, and it went down the flames, and Nintendo never, or really, Nintendo set the bar. Because they came out with that, and in my opinion, because it failed so bad, and because the public had such a negative reaction to it, uh, you know, because it just made some people sick, a lot of things, uh, it went away, and a lot of other people didn't try. You know, a lot of the big companies that could have done this a long time ago just kind of gave up. Sony's one of the ones, the few companies that had it given up, and it, they had a headset that was, it was okay. Um, it, it, it was more, it wasn't the idea of what VR, it was basically just the idea of having a big movie screen attached to your face, like a screen that you could just put on and, you know, it'd be like watching a bigger TV. It's not VR, okay? Um, which is uh, this VR. Really great demo. Actually, hopefully we can do it later if we have time. Um, where you walk around, and there, there it is, actually, you walk around um, in a Tuscany village that's set in Italy, uh, and her reaction is just absolutely. Um, amazing. And what I love about this is because this is one of the reasons I got into VR. Uh, my mom actually uh, passed from cancer and she spent time in a hospice care facility. She loved tech. She would have loved this. And I know that there's bedridden uh, people who have disability who are in hospice centers around the world and who just, maybe even a kid who's bedridden for a short amount of time, that if we could put him in a headset, if we could just give him a headset by his bed side and let him feel like he's walking around, you know, feel like he's there communicating with us on a regular basis, I can only guess that that's got to be good for that kid. It's got to be good for his psyche. That instead of he can't be out with his friends, he could at least do a really great example of it in VR. So I'm, I'm excited about that. And when I, when I watch this video, it just gives me hope that that's, that's kind of where we're heading. This one is another great one, I don't want to show these, but uh, this is a, a guy who, who uh, they, they told, um, you know, for the first time, hey, this is a roller coaster, and of course he doesn't like roller coasters very much, and uh, they said, well, you know, you won't feel it, you won't feel the feelings in your stomach as you're going up, and uh, sure enough, he's so lost and immersed, his friends even have to end up catching him because... Um, he, he just has completely forgotten. And this is what a term that I'm going to go into a little more, but it's a term that they're still actually trying to work out and develop. Basically, it's called presence. It's the idea that even at the grandest IMAX you could imagine, even if you had the front seat center row of that IMAX, at the most, all you can feel is, quote unquote, immersion, meaning that you're actually surrounded by the screen. The screen is there, and you're surrounded by the sound. VR is different. Presence and the idea of what it means and what VR can bring is that you actually forget you are just watching a screen. You become the character. You are looking through and into a world and you forget that you aren't there. See, he's about to go down this hill here and he has forgotten where he is. He is more immersed in that. And that to me is powerful because if this can be done on a simple roller coaster that a kid built in a weekend, okay, that was just excited about the rift. This kid didn't even have a rift, okay? He just built this coaster because he knew he could and gave it to people. And then sure enough, 20,000 people downloaded this coaster and it's been a huge hit and a success for Oculus because 
it's just a tip of the iceberg. It's just a tip of the iceberg. And everybody, you know, loves roller coasters. <laughs> but so anyway, let's go to the present. How did we get from the old school VR to now? And who did it and how did it get there? And, you know, because I think that's important too, because you know, a lot of people forget that I don't know, innovation is still happening in this country, I feel like. And it is. It's happening right now, all around us. And I um, want to go a little bit of that and talk about the development and then some of the time frame of the release when you can expect to see this in a while. So, Palmer Luffy is his name. I love this kid because literally, he just wasn't satisfied. And I knew that's what it was going to take to achieve VR, basically. Uh, the, some of the story goes, um, and it's funny, I was actually visiting the same place he was at the time he was developing this stuff, you know, kind of for a different reason, but I came across his post, and sure enough, he was the most <laughs> ecstatic kid in the place, you know what I mean? It was like, well, if there was a kid that was working on it, this is him, and sure enough, he had collected at the time the highest amount or all of the HMDs that existed in the world, which was 48. Most people didn't know at all there was 48 different headsets in the world, right? But his kid had collected all of them, and not only did he collect all of them, but he wasn't satisfied with any of them. He, he was just like, it's not enough, it's not what I want. What he wanted, okay, was what the Matrix brings us, right? You step into this place, or you put this thing on, and you forget that you're in your chair. Or you're, and he didn't, he didn't feel like the tech, he felt like we should have the tech, but he didn't feel like uh, any of the competition out there was doing it. So American innovation, when people say, we aren't American, uh, innovating anymore, I just, uh, it makes me want to throw up. Because a kid just did it in his garage, and he turned, a crowdsource funding project, which is completely another topic, which I'd love to go into, but crowdsource funding, which is the, you know, basically the pitching in of Joe Schmoes, you know, a dollar here, two dollars here, ten dollars here, to make a product like this available. And he went with, you know, not a lot of money or whatever in his pocket to Kickstarter, put it on there, was hoping to only get fifty thousand dollars and got two point four million. Okay, that was on Kickstarter. That happened, right? So that sent him into a whole other wave of success, which, for the story a little bit, thank Skylar for coming up here and, and doing his thing, but Facebook gets it, okay? Mark Zuckerberg gets it. Um, because they went in 18, well, 19 months from here to here. And if this isn't real, if all this what I'm talking about is fake, well, why did one of the most powerful people in the, in the, in the world just buy it for $2 billion? So it is real, and the people who are spending time developing it and, and, and creating content for it get it. You know, they get it. But we are, don't get me wrong, on the very front lines. I love the point Skylar brought up in his speech about the iPhone. I was working at AT&T when the iPhone was launched, and I kid you not, it came in, the Apple rep came in, sat us all down, six or seven employees of our store, six months before the iPhone came out, the first one. And they sat us down and we're quite serious. And the Apple rep goes, so we're going to release this phone in like six months. And it's five years ahead of every phone on your shelf right now. And we're like, yeah, right. Like this was at a time when mobile phones changed like this. Six months and the, the coolest phone was like yesterday's news. So for them to come in there and say they, were, they had a phone that was going to be five years ahead of the game, that was going to take us that far forward, it was kind of unbelievable, but this is that same type of moment. This is that moment where some people get it, some people see the potential of what this is going to be, and the ones who are working on it to build that future. So I'm really excited about the development how this came about. This is it. So this is Oculus Rift, and this is what hopefully we're going to get to today, the DK1, which I, uh, which I love, which I mean, just, people talk so much crap about the DK1, but it's like it still provides enough to, to get VR. You know, I put hundreds of people in my, in my kit, and the expressions are always the same. Um, amazing. This is the future. I mean, it's just, this is the DK2. And this is the one, hopefully, they're going to release in just a couple months, and I will be hopefully getting as well. High resolution. So a big problem with this is that it's, it's pretty advanced, and the hardware in it requires a lot of horsepower. So in order to push certain resolutions or higher resolutions, you need even more power, and you need a high resolution screen and the technology just gets more and more complicated as you go. Uh, but that's exactly why Oculus just hired some of the best and brightest minds around the world to solve some of these technical issues. Um, these are just some tech specs for the geeks out there. And uh, these tech specs are the, let's say, the bar that it takes to 
achieve good VR. If you don't hit these things, uh, one really important one is latency. So the first dev kit one here is 50 to 60 milliseconds. But where it needs to be, how fast your brains are, are way faster. Now, our brains are not 50 to 60 milliseconds. Our brains are around 20 to 40 or so. And when you get below 20 milliseconds, most people's brains cannot even discern that difference. If I showed you something that was 19 milliseconds versus 18 milliseconds, you couldn't tell me the difference. But once you get below that barrier, which is what they're working on now, that's when the magic starts to happen. That's when you're turning your head and you don't notice that the screen is lagging behind it all. It's just one to one. That's, that's the magic. So developers, how many of there are us out there like me? You know, 40 plus thousand independent devs. You know, it's crazy. I'm a little sad because like he brought up in his speech, the internet is just such an amazing place to find basically anybody you're passionate about. If you have uh, an idea or want to chase something down that no one in your neighborhood is working on, the internet is a place to go find people who are chasing on that. It doesn't mean they're not out there. It just means you're not looking hard enough. And 40,000 independent devs have found that the rift is the future and that they're starting to build content for it. Um, I'm really excited. I've seen more exciting things come out the indie development community than I have the big companies who are putting real dollars in this. I'm talking about millions of startups that are you know, trying to be real AAA titles. I've seen the most unique and, and, and interesting things, and hopefully we'll get to a few, from these indie devs. So they're my, they're my like, you know, that, that's, that's who gets me excited. These guys, who they don't get paid anything. They're just out there believing that this is the future and believing that what they're building is going to change the world. So, you know, that's what I'm excited about. So like I said, there are some big games and titles, but we have time to go through. So just a quick little timeline I'll put together. DK1 release, you know, pretty good thing. John Carvacco, one of my heroes, joined Oculus. This was kind of a pivotal moment. That's when the creator of Doom joined. Okay, I don't know if you guys have any Doom fans out there, but I loved Doom as a kid. And it was one of those games that like, when it came out, I was like, Oh my god, I didn't know a game could be like this. I didn't know a game could be this like intense and in your face. Um, but anyway, he joined. And that was uh, that was really exciting. And then also Oculus won with a prototype. Best of CES, okay? Best of CES is the consumer electronics show that all the big companies vie for, Sony, Microsoft, you name it, and they put all their hottest and best products out there. Oculus with a prototype won two years in a row. Two years. Not even a consumer model that you can buy in a store. Just a prototype of what they're building. One, best of CES, twice. So I think that was just speaks for itself. Exclusive titles, like I said, that are coming. The DK2 that's right around the corner. And then the consumer version one, which is everybody's, what, like me, is excited for. Because you would hope they've taken care of a lot of these issues. Okay? And there's some issues, like I said, with DK1. But there's, hopefully, by the time we get here, they would have taken care of most of them. So that most people can get into the roof and not feel queasy at all, not feel any simulation sickness, any type of side effects. And they have to get a lot of things right. I mean, you're basically combining the best technologies in the world, trying to put them into a small little box and then all make them do one thing. That's it. You know, one point it comes from the cell phone industry is this wouldn't be possible, uh, possible without these phones. <coughs> Proliferation of cell phones from the iPhone in 2007 and on we started building sensors into phones that we didn't even need. Like, I mean, people had compasses in their phones and they didn't even use the compass, and then they added a magnometer, but the magnometer was, you know, to like track the position if you fell, and the accelerometer was for the games and stuff. They had all these like throwing sensors in phones, not even really knowing what all the sensors were for. Well, Oculus knew what they were for. They got those sensors out from these mobile phones and they put them into one thing, okay? Not, because those sensors were all to do different things. Oculus took all those sensors and said, hey, we're going to have one thing, and that, and that one thing is going to attract your position in 3D space, no matter where you look, wherever you learn, uh, it's following your exact position. You're, you know, so if you look to your left, you look to your right, it knows, no matter even if you turn around, that you've done that, because all those sensors have one purpose. Um, the future. So this is really what I'm really excited about because right now we're just on the cusp. I mean, like the beginning of. Uh, let's make sure I said something. Yeah. Um, in the beginning of the opportunities that are beginning to arise. So you have any developers like me who are just developing any old thing. I developed, like I said, just as my first one to get started, um, an Iron Man application where you can kind of walk around Tony Stark's house and feel like you're there and, and be there. 
Sure enough, I've actually put some kids in it, and just to see their face when they step in Iron Man suit for the first time is absolutely magical. And like I said, not the only feeling that it's the feeling that they're obviously getting, but the fact that I created it. You know, no one else did that, and I'm very excited about the opportunity that that's going to have for all these developers out here. Who, it's like building something and then really getting to see the impact that it makes when someone says. I mean, because there's no, you have to get into an experience in the in the rift to experience it. There's no other way. So if I built something specifically for you, if I built for your favorite horror game that has crazy monsters that jump out at you, that's my experience that I built for you, and you're experiencing my world. So, opportunities, and I couldn't even, honestly, I couldn't even fit them all in. I, I just tried to think of all the ones that I've spent some serious time thinking about, but I know, I know, I know I'm missing some. So, just to go through a couple. Art, I mean, if you are an artist, and you want to see, a, like, say, you want to, say you're a sculpture artist, right? And you want to build this massive sculpture, sculpture right? And, it's, and, it's, and it would take years. You know you want to do it. You could first get in a rift, have the little model drawn up or whatever, pretty easily of your sculpture that you want to do, and then just scale it up. Just scale it up to the size that you want to see it at. Well, when you get in the rift as that artist and you go to look at it, you're going to see it as you would in real life before you ever have to build it. So for artists, it gives you a way to visualize things that you just never had the ability to visualize before. Space, NASA is already using this. And that's the thing, it's, 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 it's like, NASA doesn't mess around. They're already using the RIF to control robots with, with their arms. You can see with the RIF, and this is, a, this is a whole tangent, but with the RIF, for example, the Mars rover that's on Mars right now, if they had that same stereoscopic display connected, like they do with the RIF, a scientist from Earth, or a NASA engineer, could be looking and feeling as if he is actually the guy on Mars and seeing the same perspective that we get with our two eyes. See, that's a huge part of what the Rift does that I haven't really gone into yet, and hopefully I get to cover it a little bit, but a big thing is the fact that you have two eyes, and that's the way we visualize things. It's not, when you close one eye, you lose depth, okay? It takes both eyes to work perfectly in, a, in an angle to create a 3D image that you see. That's how you know how far I am away right now. That's what the rift mimics. You actually get two independent images. You get a left eye image and you get a right eye image, and they're completely separate. That's how when you're in Mars and the rover and you're trying to see from the robot exactly how long that range of rocks is out there, you, in real life, you don't have to think about it. Now you gotta look down at the button, oh, that's the laser finder, is like, no, it's like, with the camera and drones and anything, for example, where you need to see the perspective of something that's moving, the rift would be your bed. Engineering, same goes in for art, and like I said, being able to see um, your uh, plant, being able to step into maybe a design that you're working on, or actually hold it in virtual reality, see what it's gonna be like way before you ever go, way before it ever goes to production. Um, architecture, I've actually done this already myself, but I've built a couple of apartments myself, and I've been not, it didn't take me maybe even just a few hours to build a couple of apartments that I could literally just start swapping out the floor plan, swapping out the furniture, swapping out the wall color, anything I want. So for architecture and for them to be able to visualize the design and step into their design, or even, let's say, activate the sim where the building's there and traffic's actually happening around, so you can actually get a real taste of what it's going to be like to be at some new building instead of actually just looking at it on an architectural plan, right? The most one I'm excited about is education. Um, I think education needs a complete overhaul. And I think that's a completely different topic, but I think this can just be one more tool, right, in our repertoire to get kids excited about education again, okay? And like I said, just like I'm here now doing a speech, I plan on building something that's cool for kids and I'm going to go to a classroom, and I'm going to show the teacher exactly how this works, and I'm going to get a kid excited about something. I don't care what it is yet, but I've thought of a few. For example, what if I built a scenario where you are sitting there learning as Benjamin Franklin is going about doing some of his studying stuff, learning about how he's going to do some of the first projects he worked on. Well, instead of reading about that in a book, what if I just put you next to him, and you can watch him, you can walk around with him, and, 
and, and, and engage almost with him if you want to. Not only do you get to, the kid gets to experience what it's like to actually be there, and I feel like that's the future of learning, but you also get to share the experience, like hopefully we'll get to do today, by doing a projection of what they're seeing. So, the biggest hurdle I thought about, okay, this is gonna be expensive, how are we gonna put a rift in every classroom, right? We don't need to, we just need to put one. And with one in a projector, which most classrooms already have, we can just put one kid per day, maybe that's the lucky draw of the day, and he gets to sit in the rift, and everybody else just gets to watch him go through it for the first time. Because the, the magic that happens with the rift is you know they're cut off from everyone else. They can't, like when someone gets up here, hopefully today, and puts it on, you're gonna obviously tell that they can't see you, they're just up here on the stage now. So you're experiencing what they are experiencing. You're, you're getting that feeling of, this is, you know, their excitement. It's like you're watching them, you know. It's, it's, it's hard to describe, but it's, it's real. Um, entertainment, hospice care, I already mentioned. Military, I, I, I really don't want our military to get behind. And like I said, if I gotta go talk to them, I will. But sweet Norway, I think, just put this in their tanks. So they can see right through the tank. The tank driver can just be sitting there with a rift on his head. And instead of this big tank that's in his way, they just put a camera on the outside and you can see everything through the tank, as if the tank's not there. Now, that type of visibility has never been afforded to anybody in the military with that type of application. And Norway gets it, so why, why can't we? Science, simulations, out of body. There's some really great out of body experiences where you get to experience what it's like to feel like for someone else. I think even that's going to be a future thing that people maybe even rent out or sell. Like, hey, what, uh, you know, what's the, do, experience what it's like to be Jay-Z for the day. Jay-Z's wearing a camera, right, and you put your rift on and all of a sudden you, you are him. You're seeing his hands, you're seeing him go around his house, do his thing, or maybe be, do a concert, right? But instead of you seeing this over, which is really exciting. And then this is my favorite quote to end this, which is from a great scientist that I love, Michael Abrax. He's from Valve, actually, but <laughs> Oculus. Uh, stolen away, and I'm really excited about it, but he said, we're on the cusp of what I think is not the next big platform, but rather simply the final platform. The platform to end all platforms. And basically what he means by that is the fact that within VR, if you're doing it right, you can simulate anything. You can re-simulate anything. So if I just wanted to build, for example, an app that just has you sitting down and flipping through a book and reading every page of that book in perfect detail, that could be somebody something to create. And what, I, what he's saying is that it eats all other mediums. You can technically recreate any medium, both literary, TV, entertainment, you name it, through virtual reality, if you do it right. And that's the technical challenge. The challenge is doing it right. So there's threats, of course. There's a lot of threats. Um, Scott brought some great ones at his point in, with the internet. Because if you don't have the internet, that's a huge block to being able to do even this right, right? But, um, there's ones beyond that that are just even bigger in scope, right? So hardware, I mean, right now, you just need some pretty serious hardware to run the Rift in a way that is smooth and comfortable wiring. I just had to build a brand new machine just specifically to run it because my MacBook Pro would not cut it anymore. Um, so, you, you know, you have to have some decent hardware, which unfortunately a lot of the population doesn't have, right? Public perception. That's another huge thing. Google Apps is dealing with this right now, big time, right? Everybody thinks it's, it's kind of weird. They're like, you got this camera on me all the time. And it's this perception that may kill Glass, right? If it doesn't launch, if it doesn't happen, that will be the reason because we killed it. Because everybody else thought it was so dorky that they didn't want to try it out or give it a chance, even though it has some really great, uh, it's really great, you know, I love AR and where that's heading. So good content is the last one. You know, there's, there's so many things you can build, there's so many bad things you can build. So I mean, it's like, it's really endless and, and it's really up to the individual designer to choose and make that determination of what is good content. You know, because like I said, I, I want to work in education, I want to work in uh, simulation stuff, so put stuff where I can put people in the experience, but other people are building stuff, you know, that. Is a, is a you know a little unsavory you know I guess you could say and a lot of people are just going to click that and download it and that's the experience they're going to get in VR so 
it's kind of a you know iffy world right now because what if that kid goes and gets that consumer version riff for the first time and goes and he thinks he's going to download all this cool stuff and get something really bad right by accident because like that wouldn't happen to a kid right nowadays. Um, so we got to be careful of that, and, and we're going to have to discuss and have con discussions about VR and its uh, and its implications because uh, it, it is going to have implications. If you if you have a child, for example, that is into like say World of Warcraft and is playing 30, 40 hours a week every night, chances are he's going to want to put a rift on and be in that world. Okay, because I've I've done it and it's amazing. Like I I went to worlds that I grew up as a child playing in. When you're there in the rift, it's absolutely ridiculous. Okay, so for example, one one I did was uh, the Mario Brothers uh, Mario Brothers uh, race car. You know, I always just played that game as a kid, the race car. But when you're the, when you are Mario, when you're racing and you're like looking around and like riding over the bridge and you get shot over into this mountain, it's wild. I mean, as you just get all this nostalgia coming back, it's crazy to be in these worlds, and um, it's 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 exciting, but. The long term, all right. So there's definitely uh, some long term stuff, and like I said, I, there's really so many. It's kind of hard to project and talk about, you know, the ones that are going to be the most important one. But my mom brought, you know, kind of caught me onto this one, uh, which was new economies. She believed that virtual worlds had the ability to be just, if not like our real reality now. She believed that within those virtual worlds, you could have economies almost are just as powerful as the one we currently have. Meaning like, what drives people to go buy the latest clothes or the latest this or the latest that? Well, they want to impress this person or they want to do this. Well, those same habits, traits, whatever you want to call it, are going to happen in this, okay? Because you're going to go to some space that maybe hopefully Facebook creates, right? The metaverse, the oasis, whatever we call it, where it's this great place where you can go and socialize with all of your friends and literally walk around with them, right? And then all of a sudden, you want your character to be like dressed nice. You want, you want your form of your character in the bot in the game to actually either match or I don't know have it, a uniqueness to it. I mean, I've studied this. I mean, I've seen people literally. My sister, I get not, she's pretty into second life as well. My sister created a pair of shoes um, that an avatar can buy. You can buy in Second Life, and she has a little virtual store that people can walk into and buy. She, right, kind of crazy, yeah. She sold, I think it was like $4,000 her first month, like real money, $4,000. Um, and people who wanted those shoes for their virtual character online. Okay, and that was five years ago, right? So those same people are gonna love VR, I'm telling you right now. And they're gonna be even more attached to it. And, and, and there's gonna be, like I said, entire new economies that are gonna be birthed from that Notion, I, I new forms of entertainment. So I think honestly, there's gonna be forms of entertainment we can't even really fathom yet because this is a new tool, and just like with any tool, it unlocks more things. It's it, it's a resource liberator. That's what technology is. It's what tool our tools do. So with this new tool, I think we're gonna create entire new forms of entertainment, ones that really honestly can't even be. Imagine it. And then the next step, and the one that I think is going to take VR over the top, and my, one of my heroes is working on right now, John Carmack, is making this mobile. Okay, because this whole setup is crazy. You know, computer, all these cables, plugs, it's crazy. You just don't want to go through all that. Um, and so I think VR, before we know it, is going to be mobile. And you're just going to be able to pick up your phone, put a little device over your head, and you're going to be there. So, demos, very excited to do this. And uh, we got everything set up, so who is brave enough to try out the Rift on stage in front of everyone? All right, great, so we got more good people over here. Let's reach out, let's see, did you say yeah, let's, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, we got Welcome to Tuscany, we got Roller Coasters, and we got Space, so. Yeah, we'll take you through the whole, the whole spiel, and hopefully everybody will hear me. I'll do this one time. Um, yeah, so we'll put these uh, behind your neck first. Just uh, behind your neck, just sit behind you. And then uh, you come here and get this going for you. Yeah, that's fine. I'll hand you the controller. 
watch the first one. Let's see there. All right. Take off the VR here. All right. All right. Can you hear it inside of there? Yeah. Great. All right. So turn turn your head to your left. Sweet. Turn your head to your right. All the way to your right. All right. Uh, look straight up. Look uh, straight down. And now try to turn and look all the way behind you. All right. Do you feel pretty, pretty comfortable? Yep. All right. So I'm going to hand you the controller. And you're going to be able to start moving your character around however, wherever you want to go. And now some heat here. Oh, called. Sorry about that, buddy. And now, now turn to your left. Are you seeing it now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. There you go. And you want to look straight up and all the way behind you. Sweet. All right, so you got the controller in your hand and just take your time because this is going to be loud. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be a little uneasy at first because now you're sitting in the chair, but you're about to start moving your character. <laughs> so, so just, you know, take, take, take your time at first and you start moving your, oh, moving yeah. your guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever you want to go. Oh, yeah. And so what I, what I want to tell you guys about what he's hearing right now and what's so special about VR2 is 3D audio. Okay. Most of the stuff you heard just isn't 3D audio, but 3D audio is, if I'm here and I hear something go off over there, I know where it's coming from. I don't have to think about where it's coming from. That's what you get when you're inside the rift at all times. So if you turn around and the fountain, the water fountain was right here, when you turn around, you're going to hear it behind you now. And that's for all sound in VR. So that really, I mean, for scary games, it's absolutely insane. But um, for stuff like this, it's cool too because I mean, you hear the fountain, you hear the water outside, and uh, Here's the thing, I want to put some, some elderly people in some great experiences like this when they're just on their, on their bedside and see, and see what happens. See, what happens. see if they enjoy walking around on a beach in Italy with the sun setting um, in high, in high depth. Somebody that's taking their time to be passionate to put someone in VR, right? They can get a really bad experience. And I've had friends that have jumped in it, ones out here on stage right now that you put them in the wrong way, and um, they can have that at that time. So. Well, whenever you're ready. Feeling good? All right. right. All right. Feel free to put your arms up if you want. <laughs> It's, it's amazing when you're hearing the sound of the track go up, your mind knows what that sound feels like, and you start to get your hands start to sweat, and you start to get nervous. You can just feel it. And then what's crazy, this is only three senses right now. This is only hearing the sound and position. Wait till we add touch or smell, right? Um, You can look around. <laughs> <laughs> Try looking to your left. I think you told me that. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Look around a little bit. It is scary. Like, you know, like I said, I mean, you gotta, people say it's funny. They're like, I'm by the local coach. And I put them in and they're like, no, I don't. No, I don't. <laughs> I thought I liked roller coasters until I got in this one. It's no, like, sir, if you're talking to me, I can't hear you over the it's uh very loud. <laughs> oh <Sorry>. loud. <laughs> she <gets> full of <laughs> 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 and being able to get that solid sixty. Because if you're 
frame rate drops below 60, that's when you start to have problems. It starts to be, you know, your, your brain needs at least basically 60 in order to feel comfortable. So, um, so yeah, I mean, like I said, you, so as far as building a machine from scratch, yeah, I think you can do it for probably like 800 bucks. To have a machine that could probably run most of the stuff you're going to be. Now, you know, if you want to run Crisis 3 at 60 frames a second and be in the Rift, which I've done, um, then you're going to need a beast. I mean, you're going to need everything. But, um, because not only are you displaying the image once, you're displaying it twice. So it's got to be able to basically run the game twice. Um, let me get this stuff pretty late. I don't think this one has controller support. So when you're in these experiences, you're the, you're the director. You get to choose where you want to look, where you want to, you know, what you, what you want to participate in. Exactly. Everyone's different. But you get to, in this, you get to learn at your own pace. And any kid that's in it, you just see him, I mean, just naturally. This is a 3D printed, let's call it a prototype VR headset. All right, so lenses, same type of setup, download an app to your phone, and literally, I mean, I don't know if we have time, like I said, for someone to check it out, but there's a great, I'll just show you actually, there's a great roller coaster app for your phone. All right. So our phones are really powerful phones that everybody takes for granted. Um, can start, we're at almost the point where we can start doing these type of graphics now. It's not five years down the road. It's like next year. It's like the new Galaxy S5, the quad-core processor that it has, can probably run some pretty decent VR experiences right now. And this is completely portable. Completely. You don't need any wires. And you're there. Our phones already have the internet connections that we need. So my guess is that this is coming very soon, you know, and so whether, you know, this seems like it's on your radar for people who have very powerful machines and want to go to that level, um, or do you want to just do the basic simple experiences like, you know, just being a, uh, a coffee shop and be able to talk with someone who's worlds away, you know, by just slipping one of these and actually feeling like you're there. So thank you so much for being my first, like, VR audience ever, and uh, I hope to you know, give more talks about this. I, I hope you can tell I'm really passionate about this. No one's paying me to do that. I'm just, I'm really passionate about this. I want people to um, embrace VR and not be afraid of it because I really, I really feel like it's got some very positive benefits for our society and, and what we're going to do. So, thank you so much for. for